Um, so Dennis, what do you think the conversation is right now around the Fed table, around the FOMC table? What are the governors and presidents most focused on? I mean, very few people get the opportunity to sit there. You know what it's like. It seems incredibly difficult right now. Every time we have this conversation, we kind of think we come back to the Fed really being between a rock and a hard place. Just such a diff- so difficult navigating this. What do you think the conversation is like right now? Well, there are several conversations that go on. There's a conversation among the governors in Washington who are co-located and and mostly in the office, I would say. So they they have a chance to to compare notes on their assessment of the, of the circumstances. And then the presidents of the reserve banks who are out in their individual reserve banks may or may not be having many conversations among them among that group but uh, are talking to their economic staff almost every day to evaluate uh, the situation. What I think is the focus at the moment would be first sort of what is the core inflationary picture? What, what is the econ- how is the economy trending? And then second, what are the risk factors associated with the debt ceiling and the sort of on again, off again, small and regional bank crisis, or crisis may be too strong a word, small and medium bank liquidity issues that is, it seems to be feeding a credit contraction or, or at least a backing off of uh, credit availability. Those are the things that seem to me uh, to be on the table at the moment. Mm. You know, I, it just occurs to me, I'm not sure that everyone really understands the way it, uh, you know, the way it works. Um, and the the Fed presidents play a really important role in that dialogue, don't they? It's, it's my understanding that you're really, I don't want to say boots on the ground, but have that um, view into the real economy in the region that you're operating in to get a sense of what's happening. Because the U.S. is, it's an enormous economy. It has a lot of different, some areas are experiencing you know, certain dynamics and others are not. I would assume that that information coming from the Fed presidents is extremely important in the decision making. Yes, I, I'd like to believe it's very valuable. And I think uh, the governors and I'm quite certain Chair Powell values the input that they uh, that they all get from from the, the various uh, Fed districts. The, the process between meetings is a very important process. And the staff and the presidents of the reserve banks are engaging with uh, business people and community leaders throughout their regions and asking the question, how are you experiencing the economy? What are you worried about? And what, wh- How does it feel to you? You're going to get different answers depending upon the sector represented by the, the person being interviewed. But all of that is uh, accumulated and and synthesized into something called the Beige Book, which is mm-hmm. really is really a book of uh, or a uh, um, a report of anecdotal inputs, and those anecdotal inputs are often repeated at the table at the Federal Open Market Committee meeting, and and I think are are, are a valuable input, even though. It's anecdote. It's not data. It's not hard numbers. It is still used as part of the inputs to the decision. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what you're hearing from people, um, I, I think sometimes gives you, especially when you're starting to hear it from different regions, um, it gives you a fantastic insight, I would think, into what's going on and maybe a little bit more in the moment than you know some of the data, which we know just by nature, the way it was collected, or at least it used to be, lags. So so right now, you mentioned the problem, the, the, the concern that's probably um, going to be expressed after seeing that expectation number, because expectations matter so much. Fed governor, prior to that, Fed governor Michelle Bauman, Bauman already came out warning that more rate hikes might be needed. Do you think that now, having seen that expectation data, do you think that the Fed's going to have to raise rates again in June, what are the options that they're likely weighing here? I think it's a complicated picture because you, you, you. I think you first start with um, the evolution of of the inflation problem and the economy, absent the 
banking situation, banking system situation, and absent the debt ceiling. So if you were just to isolate that and look at uh, the probability of a pause versus the probability of, of another rate increase, it will depend largely on the inflation data. The data we received this week struck me as confirming a view of gradual disinflation, mm. but not rapid disinflation. So, you know, the Fed is not getting the climb down the ladder that it's looking for. And uh, that would argue that they would at least consider another rate increase at the at the upcoming June meeting. Having said that, in the real world, they have these other two factors, and we don't know today how they're going to play out. The trend of 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 credit availability is to some degree evaluatable or assessable. And this uh, this week we saw we had the senior loan officer survey, which seemed to say that banks, for a variety of reasons, were raising their credit standards and at the same time, credit demand was declining. So it's a shrinking credit picture for more than one reason. The debt ceiling is is a real wild card, it strikes me. And, and we will know, I hope, in the next few days how that's going to be resolved. And I hope it is resolved uh, with the debt ceiling being raised. But uh, if it goes to the to the just the eleventh uh, hour or more, it's it's uh, it's risky. And uh, and in a default situation, I'm sure the committee would have to factor that into their decision. So, as I said, there there are there there's more than one factor at work here. Some of them are very contingent. Some of them are more predictable. But, uh, you know, the, at the end of the day, there were only probably two major decisions, either to pause or to, to continue with a rate increase. Mm. My own handicapping of it is that the, the, the committee is now in a position to pause if there are compelling reasons to do that. Yeah, and I've got to think the two you mentioned are are, are huge concerns. Uh, the when it comes to the the strain in the regional banks, I mean, won't another rate hike just exacerbate the situation? Well, um, I mean, we have talked people talking about bank walks. And they're not talking about bank runs, but they are talking about bank walks, and and there's a concern that that's just going to continue. Yeah, I think I, I don't think you can deny that that raising interest rates has, to some degree, caused this problem, and therefore continuing to raise interest rates certainly doesn't make it better. Even if banks are hedged, even if banks are are uh, relatively liquid, um, raising interest rates doesn't make it better. So far, the committee has tried to separate the two issues. Financial stability on one side and inflation and monetary policy on the other. That was their position coming out of the, the most recent FOMC meeting, that these are separable issues. And I think the committee will try to continue to do that. But the severity of the, of the conditions that, that we're facing you know, could very well force a, a greater weight on the regional bank and small bank liquidity issues, even in making a decision on monetary policy. Yeah, it, I mean, they 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 would like them to be separate, but that that doesn't seem very tethered in reality. Um, you know, to say they're separate. Uh, I it, well, how I, I do think they you, you know how do they continue to hold on to that line? If if you roll the film back a bit. And you remember that we had three bank failures, actually Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, and then with a bit of a lag, Republic National Bank. And I think Jay Powell was probably working from the best information he had, but in, in so many words in the press conference, he said uh, the problem has been ring-fenced and, and the deposit outflow of, of, uh, of other banks ha ha has uh, 
essentially ceased. That that is what I heard him say in the press conference, and that could have been their assessment at that time that this was a matter related to three banks, and that the problem was largely contained. In that state of the world, separating monetary policy from financial stability policy would make sense. You don't have to allow one to pollute the other. But we have seen this week, mostly in stock prices, we've seen a continuing pressure on some of these banks. And and to some degree, that the, the declines in stock prices reflects a continuing questioning of their survivability or their uh, solvency. And it's just a matter of how severe this problem continues to be and whether it cascades. Do um, you have any concerns about it being systemic? The banks, the individual banks themselves are not systemic in the way we thought about systemic risk back in 2008 and 2009. And what I mean by that is the failure of any individual bank is not going to bring down the system. But what we seem to be experiencing here is collectively this size of bank, call it a medium-sized bank, a, a, a regional bank. Collectively, if you had a, a succession of runs on these banks, that's a systemic event. It's, it's going to really rattle the um, the economy and could lead to something far worse that internationalizes or moves upstream to some of the larger too big to fail banks. So, I, you know, I do think you can argue that, that what we have seen and what we may be seeing cannot be dismissed as not, not systemic. That's a double negative yeah. there, but but I'm 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 trying <laughs> to be a, I'm trying to be a little bit more subtle in the in the choice of words than just to say it's a systemic event. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand what you're saying. I mean, in in the in, you know, given the interconnectedness of the global economy, it's really hard for me to get my head around how anything's ring fenced. But this this brings up a, a really good question that Colin has: How does the Fed check for accuracy of information? And I'm thinking of it in terms of the speed in which things happen. So we know when we've seen some of these issues, especially with Silicon Valley Bank, it was sort of a virtual bank run, right? I mean, it it happened in a way that we've never really seen before, given the fact that people now have bank apps on their phone. Is the Fed equipped to deal with that information in that kind of speed, or is this something they're likely talking about? Well, I'm sure they're talking about it. Let me piggyback on something you said, and you referred to the to the nature of the bank run that we saw with Silicon Valley Bank. Um, I think you can make the argument that we are in a new era of bank uh, runs. It's, it's not your grandfather's bank run. Mm. Uh, you know, it's 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 not. Uh, it's a wonderful life with people standing in line outside a bank. It's uh, chief financial officers with uh, unguaranteed deposits who are on their cell phones moving literally billions of dollars around uh, to find a safe haven, and it can happen extremely rapidly. So I think everyone learned in the Silicon Valley Bank episode that, that there is simply a new modern bank run, and it's different than maybe the way it had been conceptualized as a risk, even with recent years. And no one realized how rapidly this can develop. The impact of social media, for example, mm -hmm. was not on anyone's radar screen that I'm aware of, or if it was, it was a very, you know, academic, uh, you know, in the background kind of recognition that maybe runs could develop uh, with the help of social media. Well, we've experienced one now, and I think everyone is upgrading their real-time information gathering for accuracy and for speed. Uh, speed, in some respects, maybe is as important as 100% accuracy. You can be 80% right and, and still make a decision that can forestall a problem. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, when we're talking about, I just want to go back to the the. Uh, you know, the strains in the banking system and the credit 
crunch that's sort of happening as a result of that. Um, we had a guest on earlier this week who was saying they're kind of estimating that it could be the equivalent of maybe three rate hikes. Some people have said as many as six. I mean, clearly this is going to be a drag on the economy. How are you thinking about this? How how much of an impact do you think it will have in terms of slowing the U.S. economy? I think it's very hard to quantify in terms of 25 basis point rate hikes, one, two, or three. I think that's a, a you know, that's a, a useful way of trying to make your assessment as scientific as it can be. But I, I just, I think it's, it's, it's difficult. But what appears to be developing is a, the banks are pulling in their, the, the, how should I put it? The banks are raising their standards and becoming much more selective in terms of credit. Mm. And at the same time, the demand for credit is declining, probably driven by a gradually slowing economy, which is the result of the rate hikes we've had before. So in th those circumstances, I think there is a trade-off between uh, the banks doing the job for the Fed and the Fed doing it itself by raising interest rates. In other words, I think the Fed can make a judgment, and I'm sure there will be different estimates of the impact of, of the credit picture um, voiced at the table in June, but make a judgment of the, the substitutability of bank credit contraction versus another rate hike. And I think they're probably now in a situation of being comfortable making that kind of judgment and therefore putting a pause on the table. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be on on that side of the ledger. I want to get to um we have a bunch of questions. I want to get to a couple of them before we before we flip over. Um and this is uh this is uh, <laughs> this is an interesting one. Uh, Achilles, everyone keeps complaining that the Fed's not looking at the right data, but isn't the Fed aware of this? Because I'm pretty sure there are smart people in the Fed versus what people generally give them credit for. <laughs> well, yeah. My experience is there are a lot of smart people in the Fed, and uh, I would not have survived in the job if I weren't surrounded by people who were a lot smarter than me and 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 better educated, and, and, and particularly in economics than I was. So yes, uh, on the matter of data, the, the Fed does not have um, a, at least much of a stream of proprietary data, other than maybe the surveys and the anecdotes that are collected between meetings, as I referenced earlier. So the Fed is looking at the same data that Wall Street is looking at and that money management firms are looking at and that academic economists are looking at it's the same data um, and you know no privileged information in the fed so the question really is how much uh, confidence do you have how much do you rely on the public data that that come out mostly out of the government but out of uh, some private firms and and other organizations that that issue a data series of one kind or another and the difference between the Fed and most other consumers of the data is the Fed has literally hundreds of, of economists who are following the data. So it's sort of more people working on it as opposed to something that's uh, proprietary. And, you know, I think those people are extremely well qualified. They understand the underlying methodologies, which is important to know where the numbers come from and how the numbers are, are actually calculated and uh, periodically are in touch with the, the statisticians who are the source of those, of those data series. So mm. that's a way I would characterize the, you know, they have enough smart people question. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's people who are doing it in depth all the time, you know, so yeah. they really, I think that really gives you sort of some sense of ownership. Um, just, to, just to give you a little bit more color, 
when I was at the Atlanta Fed and important data were I- issued, we would have a meeting any week of the seven, six, seven weeks between meetings. So it's a continuous process. We would have a meeting, talk about the data that had come out and what its implication would be. Uh, Benjamin asking, uh, in terms of the banking situation, is it possible to solve these bank run risks simply by removing the reserve requirement for loans? No, I don't think that alone, uh, that, that may help in, in the sense of just easing up a little bit in terms of, uh, available funds and so forth for the, for the banks. But I'll answer that by saying, um, you know, in, in a in a bank run, no amount of relief from reserve requirements is going to save you from from the kind of of deposit outflow that, for example, Silicon Valley Bank saw. And and this is me speaking here. I I don't want to mm-hmm. attribute this to anybody else as a view. A bank is a fairly fragile edifice in the first place. Leverage of 10 to 1, basically. So a small capital base relative to total assets. Uh, Also, a tendency to borrow short and lend long, which is um, obviously is, is, is an insolvency problem waiting to happen if everything happened at the same time. Running a bank is uh, reliant on the law of large numbers, that you have deposits coming in and deposits going out every single minute of every single day, but it all adds up to stability, providing there is confidence out there among depositors and the general public. So it is terribly reliant on trust and confidence. Mm. And when that confidence is shaken, the in I would call it the intrinsic fragility of the structure of a of a bank gets under pressure. I mean, it just or it begins to express itself, and that, that's in some respects what we're seeing. That's a fantastic description. Does that concern you massively when we again look at the ability for someone to tweet something and cause everyone to pick up their phone? How do you address the issue of confidence and trust? Well, I do think we may have seen a a major change in in the dynamics of that confidence and trust question, mm. uh, or we've experienced it with uh, the recent uh, bank failures, because as you point out, it's just, it's just uh, an influential tweet can start uh, a, a you know a, a bunch of market actions that bring down conceivably bring down an institution that otherwise should be stable that it, it, you know is is you know more or less fundamentally in pretty decent shape um, and managing its problems but social media can create um, just a a panic that uh, is all psychological but it's real it it has its effect so I, you know, I do think uh, uh, we're in a somewhat different world, and I'm sure the regulators are evaluating, you know, how do they operate within that kind of context? Yeah, I would think so. I was going to say, I smell a white paper coming. I certainly hope <laughs> someone's very quickly, <laughs> very quickly looking into this. Uh, we have a bunch more really good questions. Um, we have hit the bottom of the half hour, so if you'd like to continue with us, make sure you scan that QR code. For those of you who have to jump, Have a fantastic weekend. Hope you get out. Enjoy the beautiful weather.